couldn't be that good for Confucius. Um, and that's because family always comes first. There is just no getting around it. No getting around. So you, if you look at um, not 1438, 1528, it is. The pretender Duke of Shu. It's one of the most uh, uh, well known of the, the Analects. And the Chinese are debating it hotly now uh, in China right as we speak uh, to be worrying about this. Uh, now it's not the, no, 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 12. Oh, who has it first? Um, it's the, 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 the pretender Duke of Shu. Uh, who points out to Confucius, here we have upright King Akun, his um, father stole a sheep, and he turned, he turned his father in. And Confucius says, well, in my village, a son covers for his father, a father covers for his son. Um, and where is my memory? Oh, I can't remember that number, but you will remember it. Now, that is not to be read as, if you will, a statement of a fact, a kind of simple-minded anthropological uh, statement from a participant observer type. It's 1318? 1318, that's when the aliens are okay. 1318. <laughs> there is an unequivocal message there. There are no real conflicts. Where is your greatest loyalty to the state or to the uh, to the family, I mean, that's the way the opening expressions in the, uh, the Plato's dialogue, the Euthyphro. Uh, when Euthyphro is going to court, you meet Socrates, why are you going to court? He says, I'm going to prosecute a murderer. My goodness, who is that? My father. Wow, says Socrates. You must be very advanced in wisdom to think it will please the gods to prosecute your own father. <laughs> being not a little sarcastic. <laughs> it turns out the youth throw has the foggiest notion of what pleases the gods anyway. But, the dialogue. but at the end of the dialogue, notice you never find out how you resolve conflicts between the family and the state. All we know is that youth throw can't give any good reasons for the choice that he has made uh, to do. Confucius, there is absolutely, there is just no question about it. So that, that's, a, again, remember what I said quickly the chi yesterday, the, the Chinese tradition tends to be analytic and normative. Western <coughs> philosophy tends to be explanatory and justificatory. Normative in the sense is analytic, here's the situation. Normative, cover the problem. Can I ask, I, I don't know if you know the answer to this, but then, <clears throat> if family comes first, then after you know after the Cultural Revolution, which really tested those you know loyalties or whatever, so you have you know one or two generations brought up without that idea, N and then you mentioned yesterday how Confucianism is coming <coughs> back or they're, they're kind of using it in a, in a certain way. I think so. I don't know if you know the answer, but that's the biggest break of all, isn't it? I mean, if you're not loyal to your family and the Cultural Revolution made you not be loyal to your family, mm. how do they heal from that? Or how do they get back to any sense of Confucianism? Well, it was, well it's not getting back to Confucianism. It's, it's, it's rehealing the family. And they're not altogether doing a good job of it, but not simply because of the break of the Cultural Revolution. Because while there was turning your father and your mother and participating. There were a lot of ways where not quite as much of that happened as people thought, but there were big family breaks. But those probably could have been healed because the Cultural Revolution did, didn't last beyond about half of a generation altogether. But it's also the, the, when the return of Deng Xiaoping, the coming of capitalism and individualism has also badly hurt the family. And uh, it's a good question. I'm glad you asked that, Gail. It takes us a little off the subject, and I'm sure your students occasionally ask you about contemporary China, as well as our kid, <coughs> and it's way that you can answer. Um, the e events there are inc greatly encouraging the independence. The one-child policy contributed to that, too, to weakening some family ties. Um, and the kind of hyper-individualism 
And you can see it from the, the kind of laws that the Chinese are passing now. Parents can sue their children for not visiting them. Um, you, uh, and it's against the law not to visit your parents at a particular time or to try to care for them and things like that. Uh, they're doing all, and the, the Chinese have started gaining, again, coming back to respect for age, respect for the elders. If you uh, reach the age of 90, this doesn't happen to an awful lot of people, but if you live to the age of 80, your pension is doubled. Um, from you know what it was from whatever you retired at at 60, and if you live to be 90, it is quadrupled. Huh. Your pension is just quadrupled. There's respect for the elders. Now I say it's not going to bankrupt the Chinese government because we're not that many Chinese are living to be 90. Uh, indeed, if the air gets much more foul, there won't be any of them living much beyond 50 mm -hmm. at the rate they're going. Okay. But they are trying very very hard to. Um, get some glue back into the family. And it is because the, there is a sense in which the family is at the heart of Chinese civilization. And one of the major questions every intellectual I know in China, that Joanne and I know, is ask the same question. What does it mean to be Chinese today? What does it mean to be Chinese? Uh, Marx might be something to die for, but certainly nothing to live for. Marx is, Marxism is bankrupt in China, too, as far as I can tell, completely bankrupt. Hypercapitalism doesn't appeal to Chinese intellectuals either because they did press those good parts of socialism, you know, work for all, equality, things like that. So these huge disparities, you know, the number one importer of Rolls Royces and Bentleys last year was China. Uh, incredible disparities of uh, in income inequality. The United States is not the worst in the world as long as China is here. Uh, they're even worse. There are perhaps as many as a half a billion Chinese who still make less than two U.S. dollars a day. And uh, that's, not, that, that's what two dollars will buy here. And that's what it will buy in China. And that's poverty. That's real poverty. Meanwhile, you've got a <coughs> couple of hundred billionaires driving around Rolls Royces and Bentleys. And you've got that. Then you have another dimension. So this is why Chinese are trying to think, what can we do with the family? How can we reconstitute it? What does it mean to be Chinese? Is the, the source of, one of the major sources of the corruption that the government is working hard to eradicate is the family. The family and the village. Family, clan, and village are the loyalties you have in that kind of order in the traditional Chinese family. And it's not corruption as we know it. It is more nepotism, which I, you know obviously is corruption. But it's not like Bernie Madoff, you know, ripping off his friends for millions and millions and millions of dollars. It's you know hiring your 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 sister-in-law uh, for your staff in the house or things like that. Um, nepotism, but it, it is corruption, and they do help each other. So they're saying, well, you just got to weaken the family ties. But the, the, the more <coughs> reflective members of the government, I see it in uh, Li Keqiang, at least I'm not sure about uh, <coughs> Xi Jinping yet, but they realize that that government, or the best government in the world, will never be able to provide adequate social services for a billion and a half people. Mm -hmm. Very soon, the United States better come to realize that it can't either. Mm -hmm. It can't be done. So if it can't be done, if not even the most decent government in the world, smart and moral, is going to be able to provide adequate welfare services for any population much beyond the size of Norway or Denmark, then we're going to have to have other institutions that pick up the slack. We're going to have to have other institutions that can take care of the elderly that can see to the education of the young, that can kind of keep the offenders in line. Lots of things like that. Eliminating their corrupt influences, the family and the village are two candidate institutions to do that. 
So maybe we want the government, I'm getting a little ahead of myself from the family, you can see the ties in here. Maybe a, a smart government policy would be to start providing significant subsidies for families that would take care of their own grandparents. Mm -hmm. That's just right, significant subsidies. It's more humane, it gives everybody, if you will, a little more money. It takes other things off the tax roll. Obviously, there'd be things to iron out, but it's thinking like that. Stop thinking about individuals and think about other ways that people might come together. What else? If it's true that someday the United States is going to have to face up to this too, and my own sense is that it is, even though we're far richer resource-wise, than China can ever hope to be. Um, I'm not sure we will be able to do it for very much longer either. Uh, I say even with the best well-meaning government possible, we won't be able to do it. So there's going to have to be other institutions and again family. So the Chinese bonds are weakening and they're also weakening here too. The number of dysfunctional families in the U.S. Is, you know, grows every single day. Um, and that's not good either. And where there isn't dysfunctional families, there are those that are close. There are still sexist families, there are patriarchal families, abusive families, and families that engage in a lot of corporal punishment and don't care much about their kids. It's an awful lot to worry about. But what the analects can call all of our <coughs> attention, we're paying a big price to lose this. A big price. So the trick would be all right, how can we can reconstitute the family so that it is liberatory rather than oppressive? Can it be done? What does it mean to be a family? <coughs> well, it basically means, and now I'm making the transition to the spiritual. If you look at 526, We'll see a message that, that sounds simply like a brief autobiographical statement, but it's like the other one. <laughs> that I, um, Confucius in my village, a son comes first father the father. <coughs> it's the last one. Zulu said, we would like to hear what it is that you, Master, would most like to do. I would like to bring peace and content to the aged share relationships of trust and confidence with my friends, love and protect the young. Right. Now, that is spiritual advice. I would urge you to read it as. And it is at the heart of the family as I believe Confucius envisaged it. He, of course, saw it as heterosexual, you know, me, Tarzan, you, Jane kind of thing. And a little boy in there, especially boy, more than flu. But what is important, as I see it, is intergenerationality. <coughs> you cannot fully realize your humanity for the master unless you interact with people who are older than you, people who are your peers, and people who are younger than you. You must spend time with colleagues. You must spend time being a student, if you will. You must spend time being a teacher, passing on the wisdom you have acquired. There was a time in your life that you were helpless. There will come another time in your life that you will be helpless again. In between, you're going to spend an awful lot of time helping others. Get used to it. That's what it means to be a life of a human being. So, how do we bring some fulfillment into that? Again, encumbered. encumbered. <coughs> Most of you are in that middle stage now. Are you worried about taking care of aging parents and paying for the junior year at college? <laughs> 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 but I say there was a time, and that, of course, is what it means to be what web of relations are all about. You are helping others and being helped all of the time. All of the time, if you see that your life is one long story and that you go through all these changes, a changed you through them all. That reminds me of my favorite one, which is 425. The master said, excellent persons do not dwell alone. They are sure to have neighbors. neighbors. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. 
Okay. So you see that there's an, this notion of roles and family intersect very closely, as from the verb you used, um, and that they have wide-ranging implications uh, politically, socially, uh, in that way. It is the unit. Um, your spiritual development comes from learning to extend the way you've learned to interact with, with others and to have the affection to learn to extend it beyond the family to the village, if you will, to the larger community, to the culture, and then finally to the whole human race is the goal, to feel that you are one with humankind. Alle Menschen werden wieder from German, all men and brothers, or sisters, one of the two. Uh, <coughs> that, that is if the spirituality, when you learn to understand not only loving your own grandmother, but coming to have some respect for all grandmothers. Mm -hmm learning to appreciate the uniqueness of each, but also seeing that in the roles, when you've seen one grandma, you've probably seen almost all of them. <laughs> you know, yeah, grandmothers have certain kinds of things, and, and that's the way we kind of come to a sense of shared humanity. Very difficult, let's, let me finish this, and we can take a little break, and you can kind of meditate on it. The um, pick up on the, the ancestors. You have the Chinese had an unusual uh, way of, uh, of honoring the ancestors uh, once a year. The patriarch, the word for that means corpse in Chinese, the dead body, also has another meaning which we translate in English as the personator, and it's the person who sits in for the corpse at the annual commemoration of the corpses, who's the, an the ancestor of the clan and the family, uh, sits in for them at the annual gathering of the family or the clan uh, to honor that ancestor, one of the early founders of the clan. And the, there are entreaties made to the personator apologizing for our misdeeds of the past year, thanking the ancestor for the blessings that have been brought to them. They ply the personator with food or drink, and they ask the personator, are you happy with a Personator, by the way, is usually the granddaughter or grandson of the deceased, uh, or someone close, maybe the great-granddaughter or great-grandson. And the answer is yes, 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 the food is good, the drink is good. I appreciate your homage and I know what to say and do. Uh, and that's very unusual because in, in a way they hear the ancestor talking. They, they see food being eaten and drink being quaffed. I don't know how easy or hard it is to forget you're looking at a nine-year-old rather than someone who would be 104 now. But it had significance for the Chinese. If you any of you, I'm sure if you look through the book, the, the Book of Odes, the Shurjin, the Book of Poetry, it's sometimes called. A significant number of the poems are festival poems honoring sacrifices to the high ancestor. And for the person that will do the performances, there's a long passage. I hope this will help you read Book 10 of the Analects differently, where it's Confucius at his most punctilious in terms of he will, he will not put his head on the pillow in this way, he won't turn over, he won't do this. Uh, that's the autobiographic, uh, the biographical Book 10. But another, the other book, the Book of Rituals, one of the classics, it tells you how you, you have to spend several days fasting and going through purification rituals before performing this high sacrifice, the annual sacrifice, and some other sacrifices to the ancestor, to your grandparents, great-grandparents. 
<coughs> and during these, he says, which, what you do while you are disciplining, while you're fasting, and what you're meditating on is remember, remember, try to remember how they looked. This is the book telling you, the Ligia said, try hard to remember how they smiled, the tone of their voice. And just going, and that's what you do for three or four days. You literally bring the ancestors back to life. <coughs> you are truly dead when no one knows or remembers who you were. When Chinese see that, that after, if you will, they're gone. They are remembered. When you learn that one of your jobs as a little person is to remember those who are no longer here and to thank them because it's because of them that you're here, you learn to get that sense of continuity with those who have preceded you as well as those who will follow. If you haven't got a God, you don't have an immortal soul concept, this is not a bad substitute. A very unusual form of immortality, but immortality it is. You live on in the memories of those who have come after you. Everyone in this room is extraordinarily fortunate to be a teacher, because you have students who They have more people remembering you, at least for a generation or two. And after seven or eight generations, well, maybe we won't be forgotten unless we have, you know, Lincoln, Lincoln's face on the pennies replaced by yours. <laughs> <laughs> but but it's, it's not that. It's, in Chinese tradition, it's five generations. You're supposed to respect five generations, and then they just become the ancestors, the founders of the clan. They say, well, why five generations? Why not three? Why not 14? Why five? Well, I'm generation one. My father is generation two. I certainly think about my father. My grandfather is generation three. Most of us remember our grandfathers, at least one of the two of them. Great grandfather's a little tougher. Relatively few Chinese, I think, grew up having any memory whatsoever of great grandpa. But they would have memories of fathers talking about his grandfather. Mm -hmm. And you can recall that to memory. And maybe your grandfather remembering his grandfather, generation five. Beyond that, human beings don't live long enough to do it. But that's the fifth generation. It's possible to have memories. You can link consecutive kin lines to five generations. And to help you do that remembering, you go through very highly specific rituals of purification preparatory to participating in the sacrificial ritual. And you do it twice a year, annually for the ancestor, and then once again, the so-called grave sweeping day, the Chungming festival. We clear the weeds out from the graves and put alex or incense and things like that there, burn the jaw sticks. And of course, you usually will keep a little corner of the house, too. Uh, a little place with a plaque. And now they put the person's name, where they were born, died. And there are little pieces of calligraphy, red plastic or red wood, painted wood. Um, but that remembering, that is, if you will, that is the religion of the Chinese through the ancestors. So the real spiritual trick <coughs> is seeing yourselves as part of what has gone before and what will come later. This is how the Confucians have been arguing for the importance of ecological conservation, obviously, so that your grand great-grandchildren can really thank you <laughs> for drinking, le using less water, energy, <coughs> or things like that. Now, that, however strange it sounds, it is open to human beings to be able to feel that. 
and clearly the Chinese, many, many millions of Chinese have done it. It is a very different way of being in the world than we have of being in the world. It is not easy for us to see an essential part of who we are is bound up with people who've been dead for 75 or 100 years already. Part of that is because we're Americans, a land of immigrants. A lot of us don't. Joanne and I have ancestors, great-grandparents, but we don't even know what village they came from in the old country. Slovakia from her side, Poland from mine. Just don't know where they came from. They know they came, not much records. Hard to do genealogies. And genealogies, you know, of course, for the Chinese, and not just for the well-to-do. Right? It is for, for all of us. And it's something else I tell my students, you have photographs now, that I'll bet that every one of you young ladies in this room bears a very strong resemblance to one of your great-grandmothers. Change your dress, change your hairstyle, and you're her. Uh, so it's certainly true in a genetic sense. But that doesn't get you the feeling that you have to work at ego reduction to get the spirit out. <laughs> so you can get that sense of affinity, of a sense of belonging to this line that has preceded you. And then you learn to extend it. And of course, even today, in a way, it's not surprising. People who do know <coughs> If they have, you know, you have, we all have uh, eight great grandparents. Very few Americans can name more than one or two of them. Give the full name. Unless you're a Kennedy. <laughs> <laughs> or a Bush, that's, that's right. right. Yeah. And that's how they know who they are. But that is for every one of us, if we want it to. This just makes it very strange. There is, I've said, nothing theological, <laughs> nothing out of the way in, this, in one sense. And it sounds so plausible, but yet I've never thought of it before. Or it sounds so implausible, I can't wrap my head around it. Um, this is about the best I can do for what I think. This was Confucius' insight. <coughs> you are encumbered. You are a son. You are a daughter. Make the most of it. Celebrate. Celebrate. And celebrate those who made it possible for you to be one. <coughs> and help those that you bring into the world to feel the same way. So now this goes back to the question of well, how do we heal the family? You see, there's a lot at stake in this. A lot at stake. It is. Um, one of the reasons I think Christianity is growing in China, it's also an economic matter, uh, but the weakening of family ties with the family becoming weaker and almost completely secular, as opposed to there being a sacred dimension. Uh, are, oh, it's still it's a vanishingly small group. Most Chinese don't have any use for theology of any kind, Jewish, Islamic, or, or Christian or Hindu or Buddhist. Well, Buddhist, yes, but that has theology in a very, very different way. Uh, but there is a, a, a lot going on. But if you can think about the, ho the household as being its own temple, if you will, <coughs> seeing how much of the Chinese religion is bound up with reverence for ancestors, and why, why how it confers an identity on you. It's not just that I am the son of Henry and Sally Rosemont. I, I can go back a little farther than that. Uh, <coughs> and we all can. See, all of this is available to us all if we can wrap our heads around it. Yeah. It takes discipline. It takes practice. It's a genealogy we have to do. We should find out who are it. Not so we can find out whether 18 or 19 generations ago, one of our ancestors was the, the Duke of Marlborough. <laughs> uh, or even five generations ago, he was a, um, a brave sheriff in a western frontier town. And 
Though he might have been the horse thief, the, the, the good sheriff 